Hello and welcome to this week's edition of It's Your Call, brought to you by our very good friends at Quit Now. Let's have a look at some of the decisions from the previous round. It continues to dominate discussions right across the footballing community, as he does every Tuesday afternoon. The umpire's manager joins me. It's been a busy few days. Jeff Gisham, welcome. Yeah, it certainly has, Wayne, but uh, hopefully we're on top of it and we can move forward to this week. Uh, it's a moving beast. Uh, just before we jump into the decisions, you can get involved and we continue to encourage you to do this. At AFL is the Twitter address, hashtag your call, pick out your decisions, send them through and bearing in mind we can only pick two each week and we do our best to share that around and uh, we would encourage you to continue to do that. Before we jump into the one that really dominated discussion this week, can I ask you a couple of questions? Sure. Is there a rule of the week from the umpiring department? Because that seems to be the thing. Every time that there is a particular decision paid across the course of the weekend that may not have been adjudicated as strictly as what it was on any given weekend, people would sit there and say that there's a rule of the week. Is that yeah, the case? Yeah, and look, Wayne, we get that question a lot. Uh, people see a spate of the one type of decision and think that we've emphasised something. But as I keep saying, the umpires can only adjudicate what the game throws up. And in that particular game, there were 64 four boundary throw-ins as well, which is 24 above the average, nine delivered out of bounds. So quite clearly, the clubs are playing it around the boundary line, but certainly we don't have a rule of the week. Certainly we do coaching, and if there's things from previous weeks that we could have done better in, uh, the coaches show them vision of that, show them what they've done well, but we've got to hope we don't get an overreaction. Well, this lit up social media, and a lot of media people got involved as well. This is from Bomber Bliss, and this is the deliberate out of bounds, all nine of them from last Friday night's game. Yeah, we've got the nine. We've seen Darren Glass take the ball well inside the boundary, um, work his way back towards the boundary, and then walk it out. Mackey handballs the ball along the ground. Mate, yeah, no, nah, not really. He's pointing to a teammate, but when you see the replay, how many times do you handball it at your teammate's feet? He was trying to get the ball out of bounds, and it comes back to intent. This one here, West Coast player just fists the ball straight across the boundary line. Yep. What was his intent? Yeah, no, I think that's fair, and perhaps uh, Eric may have had his time again. He'd do it differently. I still think Andrew Mackey was a bit stiff because they had a teammate in the vicinity. Yep. Um, we can see this one here, Lonigan on his left foot. Look, he does jam it off his left foot, but he's just kicked it firmly straight towards the boundary line. Um, no teammate in the vicinity comfortable with that one as well. All right, and there's a few more still to go. Yeah, Hearn here um, stumbles, makes out that he's just fumbling the football, but that's probably about five to ten metres from the boundary line. Happy to see the ball just go straight out. We want them to make a better effort than that. Can you understand the confusion, though, that you see that happen a lot of times across any particular round, and some are paid, some aren't paid? Yes, we have made some mistakes, no doubt about that one. That one there, Lonigan, two fits of punch away from his opponent, but straight out of bounds. Kerr kicking an end-over-end mm. kick up the boundary line. How many times do you see players kick like that to their teammates? Not very often. What was his intent to get that ball out of bounds? This one here, this was the one we deemed to be um, unwarranted. Based around the fact, we'll see the replay, Mackenzie trips and stumbles. And when he trips, he actually falls with the ball. Momentum takes him across the line. So that was the one we felt wasn't uh, intentional. But all the others on the night, the umpires felt intentional. When you look back at them, you've got to say, yes, they all, were all there. If we use that as the benchmark, though, and I don't mind either way, yeah. and I think everybody, and probably including yourself, as long as there's some consistency yeah. with the application, the interpretation uh, across any particular round or yeah. the season, then I think it clears it up. But I uh, did a number of games on Saturday and then one on Sunday, and there just seemed to be a loosening of the willingness of the umpires to pay the deliberate out of bounds. Is it something that varies according to the umpires on the given day? No, it shouldn't, Wayne. I mean, the bottom line is we said to the clubs, we said to the umpires at the start of the year from the Laws Committee that we wanted to be really tough and tight with deliberate. So they all knew that. The DVD that we present to the clubs, the media and everybody shows 10 examples, almost all identical to those West Coast Eagle ones. If umpires don't pay them, that's a problem with our umpires. They need to be more consistent and they get marked accordingly on that. All right, I reckon we might see those nine delivered out of bounds in next year's Rule of the Game DVD. What about some 50-metre penalties from the weekend? I think there were five in the first half of this game. Crows right. taking on Fremantle. Yeah, correct. Five in the second half. But again, you know, this wasn't a Rule of the Week, but it's what the game presents. This one here, player held after marking. We have to pay a 50 because he is delaying the play. Uh, this one here, player's mark. Mazungo stays in a protected area, puts his hands up, delays the play. Is that not a bit harsh on Mazungo there? Because Sam Jacobs has indicated as though he's going to switch the ball in play. So what? is that not play on? Well, well, unless the umpire does. And the umpire okay. hasn't called play on at that stage. So Mazungo must be passive in that situation. This one here, 
one player replaces another on the mark, so runs through the protected area, so he's come into that spot, run down the side to prevent a player from playing on quickly, had to pay that 50 metres. Uh, this one here, this is against Crowley. This is, I suppose, delay of the play, but just a silly little act. And look, we can see that it's not the biggest amount of force, but why would Ryan even bother mm. to use his knee just to give him a little bit of a, a, a hit up there? There's no need for that at all. Up by sort of paid a 50 metre penalty. This one here, Walker, again in the protected area. Umpire hasn't called play on. The player wanted to go and kick. Walker got involved. So he's not obliged to get involved until the umpire calls play on. No, I understand that. But if you come off your line, then isn't that play on? Yes, and that's what we want. We want the umpires to call play on quickly. But if they don't, that player must hold his ground and not move in. OK, we'll continue to work through these. Uh, high contact. He's high contact. And Jake Melsham got pinged for it. Yes, we can see a fend-off. Look, it didn't look much from this angle. You just saw him running and bouncing and, and pushing off his opponent. But the next angle clearly picks it up. Umpire in a perfect position to see that high fend-off. So that's one of the few occasions a player with the ball can be penalised. Mm, OK, uh, tackling needs to be done below the shoulders. And this was uh, a little bit comical. But uh, I think the correct decision in the end involving the Gold Coast Suns and the Giants. Well, the message we want to say here is, yes, you can go in and you can tackle hard. But have a little bit of a duty of care and a bit of thought about how you do it too and just laying on top of your opponent's stacks on the mill style isn't really a correct tackle so we want to reward the players with the ball against players who are clumsy and reckless with the way they tackle. Uh, Lockie Hanson and Nathan Lovett Murray involved in a very heavy clash on the uh, game on Sunday Twilight and uh, this one came from Amber Langham Amber Fur for, for, for Life I think is the Twitter handle there uh, your decision here, correct one I think in the end? Yeah look it is correct and Nathan was a little bit stiff. He came into bump. Lockie had the ball, so we've got to protect the ball player. But unfortunately for Nathan, his first bump was high on Hanson. Hanson then swung around, and you can see his uh, shoulder made contact with Lovett Murray high. So we had both players down, but Lovett Murray's first contact on Hanson was high, and we paid the correct free kick. He's uh, quite lucky in the end with that sort of forceful contact. It wasn't a serious injury he, uh, dished out to Lockie Hanson there. And the final one, uh, this is uh, Heath Scotland, and a decision that was paid high contact. I've got some thoughts on this, but I'll get your explanation. Yeah, and I know your thoughts are, Wayne, that um, any player who ducks his head um, shouldn't receive a free kick. Look, we've said pretty consistently all year that the player who's tackling in that situation must be stationary or stopped. And Daniel was still running towards Scotland mm. at the time. So uh, because he was still moving towards him, we deemed it to be a high tackle and a free I, kick to I, Scotland. I get that. But I also think that you give up the right as a player. If you've got yeah. possession of the ball and you deliberately duck your head, which you can clearly see that yeah. Heath has done, yeah. then don't you forego or forfeit the right to get a high contact free kick your way? Yeah, it's still not open slather. And I, I know where you're coming from because by ducking his head, Heath Scotland did probably put his head in a position where it was going to receive high contact. But what we're just asking Daniel Rich to do there is stop, have his feet planted, and then if Scotland goes into him, that would be play on. But Daniel was still moving towards him when the contact was made. All right, on this occasion, we'll respectfully yeah. agree to disagree. Okay. Appreciate you coming in, Goosh. Thanks, uh, Thanks for your time. And uh, you get involved at AFL, hashtag your call. Congratulations to Simon Hewitt of Lynbrook in Victoria and Diane Dean of Beechworth, also in Victoria. Winners of last week's Quit Now Reserve seat tickets. For your chance to win a double reserved seat pass to a game of your choice, as well as a 2012 Toyota AFL Grand Final Greatness Package, go to quitnow.gov.au and in 25 words or less, gives your best motivational speech, encouraging a friend or family member to quit smoking. We'll see you next week.